or himself or something for man. The sacrifice in the Bible has always been required from man to God. When Jesus himself spoke, and I read here from uh, Matthew 9, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 9, 13. It goes on like this. Uh, Matthew 9, 9 says, And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he sat at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw, his, uh, saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher sit with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And then he went on to say, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner. So, speaking about the will of God, the will of his Father, what he desired for them is mercy. What he came with is mercy. The same that Prophet Muhammad came with. Also, uh, the concept of uh, man dying for the sins of, uh, of others is, is really a Jewish concept in birth. And I'm quoting the Bible here. Here is the book of John, uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 50 and on. Uh, he says, Jesus here talking, you do not understand that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this, that's 51, he did not s say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. That prophecy was made by the high priest. And he did not make it because it, he was inspired. The Bible says because he was the high priest. And, and I see nothing in the Bible that says appointing someone as a high priest qualifies him for inspiration or prophethood. So that is Thank not you. a prophethood. <clears throat> that is not an inspiration from God. It is his own self-made prophecy. Then it goes on, and not for the nation uh, only, but to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad also referring to the children of Israel, the Jewish at that time. Uh, not only that, the Bible stops at this idea being Jewish in, bo in birth, uh, Christian in doctrine, but it goes on to clarify this in the Old Testament as well. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 29 and on, it goes to say, in those days they shall say no longer, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. For the sake of the audience, there was a proverb used in the land of Israel at that time that uh, it was a concept, a faith, a belief that if the fathers have done something wrong, the children will inherit the same sin. Even if they eat sour grapes, the teeth of the children will be affected. The Bible says, do not say this, but everyone shall die for his own sin. Each man who eats sour grapes, his own teeth shall be set on edge. The book of Hezekiah emphasizes the same thing that goes on. The word of the Lord come, uh, came to me again. What do you mean by re repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? And then quote, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, the same shall die. Thank you. Can I uh, follow I, up on that, since we have two speakers there? Yeah. Uh, let me explain something. Dr. Jeffrey Lang, we passed now one no, and a half no, hours. He, does not. he has not yet said any words. He, so. he gave up his right to speak today. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Shakir took longer than I expected. So yeah, what, uh, what I'm going to do... Okay. You want to go there and what I'm going to do, right. I'm going to take a comment from you and then we'll go back to... Uh, Dr. Lang, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. Uh, all right, on, uh, on three of the points there. Uh, you're quite, quite right when you say that uh, it does not require God to make the sacrifice. Uh, but this is our understanding of God. Uh, a parent doesn't have to make a sacrifice for children, uh, except the necessity of love itself. 
which uh, you know as a father and I know as a uh, father. So uh, that, that is part of the wonder of the gospel, that God did it out of merely the necessity of love uh, providing the way for us. Now, uh, as for uh, the quotation, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, this is actually a quotation from the Old Testament prophets, yes. uh, which is yes. uh, repeated, and so we need to look at it in its context. The context in which it was given uh, is people who s were making the sacrifices and hence feeling they were fine, and then they could be unjust to the poor and uh, unjust to the foreigner in their midst and, and all of this. And so God is saying, uh, I desire mercy. Don't, don't do your sacrifices and think that you're all right and then you can be unjust. This is the context both in the Old Testament and uh, in the That's New right. Testament. As for the idea of uh, sacrifice being a Jewish idea and not Christ himself <coughs> idea, which was certainly the implication of uh, what you said, I've already uh, quoted Mark 1.45 where Jesus said, uh, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And uh, then before the cross, he says, for this purpose came I into the world. I came for this very purpose to make a, a, a sacrifice. Uh, so that uh, we can't say, oh, this is a Jewish idea. It may have been a Jewish idea, but it was also Christ's own idea, his own understanding of his own uh, calling. Yes. Uh, <coughs> I hope one of the other brothers will take up the issue of the uh, Prophet Muhammad coming into M Mecca. It's, uh, it's, it's easy enough to handle. I'd rather do something else. And, and rather than interpret Christians' uh, scriptures for them, I, I would rather just present a, a Muslim perspective on this issue again. Because I think sometimes we're so absorbed into criticizing the Christian perspective that nobody gets any information about how Muslims feel about their life on earth. Uh, the Quran insists in many places that uh, this earthly life, and, th and this is a difficult question for all of us, I think, that this earthly life has a definite purpose. And uh, for the Muslim, he, in his own life, he tries to come to grips what pr possible purpose can it have. I mean, a world with so much suffering and hardship and adversity. But indeed, hardship and suffering and adversity are one of the three major components. And this is not, I don't pretend that this is a totalitarian view I'm setting, just one aspect I want to uh, bring, uh, bring to light. Uh, hardship and suffering and adversity are a necessary component of this earthly, uh, our earthly growth. In addition to that, our, uh, the Quran stresses the fact that God has given us intellect, uh, intelligence to weigh and to decide and to choose. And as I just mentioned in my last breath, he also gave us the ability to make choices. So in our earthly life, the Muslim perceives his earthly life that through, into his, uh, through the, these gifts and in the adversity he faces, he grows in virtue. He grows in, it's an environment where he can grow in love for his fellow man, grow in compassion, grow in justice, grow in um, uh, forgiveness of his fellow man. All the various virtues that emanate from God, that emanate from God in perfection, the Muslim in his human uh, existence tries to grow in these, in his human personality. And in so, by growing in these things, he feels that he is growing, not only feels, but the Quran confirms this, he's growing in nearness to God. So that in the day of judgment, when all these earthly distractions are stripped away, he, and even in this life as well, as he grows in these virtues and gr which emanate from God, he's growing not only in his own personal well-being, and he does feel a great sense of peace and well-being from that, and I think uh, our Christian brothers will agree with that, because it is better to give than to receive, to forgive than to seek vengeance. All these things, when we do that, to s insist on truth in times of adversity, these do give us a great sense of inner well-being and peace. It's not the material things that have, make us happy, the cars and etc. But the Muslim doesn't just feel that he's growing in these only for that purpose. The real ultimate purpose is as he grows in these, some, in the next life, when the earthly distractions are stripped away, he will have reached, hopefully, uh, as the Muslim would say, through the will